I think like you, you have people who are bad that do, that don't use Pio. Then in the middle, you know, when you use Pio, it's really good. And then when and then at some point you go surpass surpass Pio. You mentioned a couple of things. I want to start off with. You said you at some point you realized why other players were better than you and why other players were worse than you. I quote. So do you still recall like some of the reasons why some players were better than you and other players? Are worse than you and what did you learn from that and how did that impact your game yeah it, it comes back to what you were saying about you when you said that yeah you were, you were a practitioner first and then you started to study and i think like it was just this transition in my mind from like thinking that like oh yeah like being good at poker means being able to mirror pile outputs and then being like hang on like the people who win they don't do this you know and like it, like nowadays you could ask me who i respect more like the poker professor or the poker practitioner it's like obviously the practitioner, like the guy who shows up every single day and like has amazing results without playing so much like a silver. I guess Stefan was like the best example of this of all. Um, who, who like, yeah. And even I would even say Marcus is this guy as well. Um, like, so yeah, it was like starting to realize the, um, that like, yeah, like EV comes from like, let's say the most basic example, like over bluffing is spots where people underfold and un overfolding is spots where people under bluff. Um, and then starting to see the people that did this the people that didn't do this like the people who who like yeah like even nowadays if i see someone has a stat where they overfold in a spot where i know that like the average player over bluffs by a lot i'm like well that, that's an objective leak because he's he's like folding bluff catches in spots where they should be winning on average therefore that's like something that i can probably exploit and and even passively starts to pass some ev to me um and then I also started to realize as well, it's like an ego thing. Like there was a guy, Tom Battle, uh, a full ring grinder. Who I remember I used as an example for the Spit B videos where like he he was like notoriously not not strategically a great player. Like he had a lot of like what you would what would appear to be like baseline problems with his game. But every year he was making so much money. And I said to the guys in Bit B, I was like, look, like we can sit here and we can be like, look, he doesn't do these things which we've seen in Pi or so. So like, therefore we have like superiority over him. Or we can be like, look, he turns up he makes money like he makes a lot more money than most of us every single day and we can be like well he's, he's a better poker player because that's that's what poker's about and we, why is it that he makes more money um because some of his leaks aren't real leaks like they're like leaks which don't cost him ev in practice and because he's very good at the things which actually generate ev um which is game selecting playing the right times etc and like you can't you can't like devalue these skills because that is part of what being a professional poker player is uh, so I started to yeah realize put my ego to the side more and realize more that like, these soft skills are skills to be proud of and and matter as well and and just want to say in case Tom Battle I mean there's just absolutely no shots at him because I respect a lot like, the fact he's played all these years and and had the success he has has which is like hard to do when you keep to keep showing up so yeah yeah this sounds very familiar I think and and the the response that we have or at least that I heard you saying that I had as well I would then get angry you know when when a guy like that. Would show up my table and win i would get angry and then basically that anger kind of sh should have showed me that something is wrong right yeah like okay i can actually learn something from them uh and indeed like what makes a good poker player is so much more than you you know you having a couple of good plays in your arsenal right it's like you can you can be great but if you keep on game selecting wrong and keep on playing in the toughest games yeah you're you're going to be the biggest loser so i think it's very important as well to 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 estimate your skill so what did Tom Battle teach you in the end? Yeah, it just taught just taught me this idea that like, yeah, it, it taught me um, that showing up uh, and like game selecting maybe matters more than everything else at mid stakes and and like lower lower in the five stakes. And just this idea that like if you're not doing this properly, then all of this time you're spending in pyres like getting extra X percent of EV at a spot is kind of Kind of kind of pointless if, if your if your aim is to make money obviously if your aim is to play like higher than the the ladder is important and then secondly i was like well if his strategic leaks are this big like this obvious and he's still winning doesn't that tell me that like some of them aren't actually like costing me costing him ev in practice and then it started to push me more down that avenue um and then obviously start started to like marcus was playing stefan a lot of this time and i was like oh uh, yeah like what, what's stefan doing it's like obviously not what pi is doing <laughs> Um, why is it why is it that he, he's winning more than every single other player ever at this time at least um, and then the same kind of idea is it's like yeah the poker professor like doesn't play like Stefan the poker professor wins a lot less money than Stefan why is it so 
what what is what are the things that Stefan's doing to transfer AV from his opponents to him. Um, and yeah, then started to look at my own game and be like, well, are these things which I'm doing um, actually good in practice or not, and and why? So it was more like using the solver uh, less as a kind of output to copy um, and more as a kind of uh, tool to to look more at real real life strategies and and then just to continue with that also once I realized the problems I was having like in my pile copying days I, I don't think I was ever really a true pile copier as I would call them nowadays um, like someone who tries to like truly mirror the solver but I started did start to realize that like there are a lot of things that when you try and mirror the solver you always do wrong like you always make the same mistakes and I was like well I know that some of my opponents like have like publicly gone on video saying this is their strategy to mirror the solver. And, and and then I would be like, well, these guys, they're obviously gonna be doing the same things as me because they're human beings too. And like it's just too hard to 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 unless you have some like rules which aren't copy solver, you always end up making the same errors. So yeah, I started to really think more about how how like different humans play. There's like the, the and, and and like how that can result in more EV. To me in the long run. Um, and again, with Marcus around, so was unbelievably helpful for this because he, he's kind of thought as like a, a I think a lot of people perceive him as like a pyro player. Um, and he he is very, very good, but it wasn't wasn't really what he was what he's doing. So uh, I'll go into too much, don't want to go into too much detail there. But yeah, it was very, very helpful for me. I remember actually uh, re recently, I think it was yeah, I think it was Kluka who said. Yeah, you know, actually, the better you get, the more you stop playing like Pio. I think like you, you have people who are bad that do, that don't use Pio. Then in the middle, you know, when you use Pio, it's really good. And then when and then at some point you go surpass surpass Pio, right? You're like, yeah, yeah okay, Pio has taught me a couple of basic principles about you know theory and GTO that I had to understand. But now that I understand them, I go beyond Pio and exploit the shit out of my opponents. Yeah. And, and like, uh, don't get me wrong, I use Pyro every single day. Like, uh, I, I mean, like thousands and thousands of hours and probably thousands of hours still to come where I'm like, log, like running my own hands through Pyro. But it's just it's just like changing the reference point from being like, all right, I want to play the same as the output on the screen to being like, what does the output on the screen tell me? And what does that tell me about if my play was good or bad and how I might want to change it? And like, what does the strategy look like on the screen? Is that realistically something I can I can do? And is it is it something I even want to do? Like, um and if not, what can I do? Which is kind of good and and, and possible. Um, so yeah, uh, I think I, I I disagree with you for sure. It's like one of the biggest flaws in, in, that I see is people trying to like holding holding like copying solver outputs on a pedestal and thinking that's what makes you money in poker. When uh, I really don't think it's the it's the case. I took a I took a, a look at your uh, I think it was uh, your BB coaching profile. And it said that at your profile, it said, I adopted PyoSolver at a very early age. I think mm -hmm. one of my greatest skills is being able to use it effect eff efficiently to develop real strategies that work in game. A lot of people waste a lot of time in the wrong way. You also mentioned a little bit earlier about the, that you were lost in the rabbit hole of Pio. What do you think is like the biggest mistake that people make? And like which rabbit holes did you go down through in Pio that in hindsight were a big waste of time? Yeah, let's think about this. It's, um, I think just the, the one, maybe not the biggest one, but the one that comes to my mind first of all is like, um, you can just look at a node. Um, I mean, I guess a basic one, which most people are aware of now is, is like turn double barrels so that you see about the flop, you bet the turn. And it's very easy to ignore certain parts of the range. Like, at least this is what I did for a long time. I was like, well, let the, the open end straight draws, they barrel here pretty often, right? Um, and then I'd be like, all right, cool. That's basically what I'm doing. And I would like, completely ignore all the fractional hands which like a cumulative, uh, cumulatively add up to a lot of the range and are, are very important for like where the ev comes from um and especially when you start to consider what the other player might do to make better or worse yeah so like just look and be like all right my hand does kind of what i thought it would do sure move on um so that's one of the mistakes um another mistake is like striving really hard for accuracy i think um it's like, yeah, trying to be like too accurate rather than looking at the holistic picture. Uh, aggregate reports, I think, are like, I, I I think most people spend too long doing aggregate reports. I would I would say it's definitely subjective, but for me, I think like flop strategies can be are in general so close in EV, uh, particularly between sizings, 
Um, maybe if you want to range every board, then you do need to spend more time in aggregate reports to figure out which ones you can and can't. But um, yeah, flop strategies are so close in EV that kind of picking your poison, like picking how you want to play um, and then sticking with it, learning it, learning to implement it and going from there is probably better than spending hours and hours um, trying to chase that tiny, tiny extra bit of EV. Um, and um, there was something else I was going to say, but it slipped my mind now. But but yeah, these kind of ideas, I think accuracy is the biggest problem people have, like striving for accuracy, try, sorry, sorry, striving for, for perfection at the cost of like implementation. And then this is why I think, yeah, when you're a practitioner and you're playing every day, you start to realize like what, what is possible to, 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 to do rather than what is possible on pen, pen and paper to, to do. Yeah, it's like, you know, you can spend all the time and aggregate the ports and find all the optimal flop sizings. But in the end, if you don't really understand what the, a certain sizing achieves on a certain board and how that's going to influence the hand playing out on a later street, then basically, yeah, you, you can start with a certain flop sizing that was theoretically correct. But if you then butcher the hand on a later street because you don't know yeah. how it then plays out because you didn't really understood why the strategy was there in the first place, it's maybe better you just stick to something that you understand. I think playing a strategy that you understand is always going to be superior than a GTO strategy or at least a GTO sizing that you don't really understand the mechanics behind. Yeah, definitely. And I think like a, a, a very good example of this, I would say is uh, uh, Doug one who had on your podcast. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I respect, I think he's like, I, I think he's one of the very best players in the world still. Um, and also very, very, um, yeah, I respect a lot about his game. He's, he's like, very aware of his own edge as well and like doesn't take close spots um and obviously has insane results over a big sample but he he's always played like a a very what some people consider a very simple strategy and, and i know for a fact what some people would consider a very bad strategy like um uh yeah i've seen run it once videos for example where people say the way he plays it is bad without saying it about him but the way he plays he plays he understands his strategy so well and plays it so perfectly um that it's like a lot better than a lot of strategies, which on paper make make capture more EV. Um, so yeah, just a very good example of this, like someone at the at the very high stakes. And then there's the, the flip side of this again was like Stefan at his peak. Um, well, maybe Stefan is still at his peak, but he seems to be AFK somewhere. Um, but where where he would like really understand how people who tried to implement complex strategies would make mistakes, I think. I never spoke to Stefan, but this is what it, it always looked like he was doing. And then like absolutely massacre them in the spots where like they're making mistakes with with their complex strategies. And they would never then they would never understand it. So but look, Stefan's shown up with another hand again, which is like a free big blind mistake in Pyro. Um, and like I'm playing this strategy, so I, I'm beating him without understanding that like what he's doing is he's like anticipating the, the mistakes you're gonna make and you are making them, but you you just aren't aware of it. So yeah, just two different approaches, but both kind of thinking along the same lines, I think, really.